any given day, prison doors open and dozens of men and women step out into the daylight. But what happens to these people when the heavy doors close behind them? The bleak reality is for many, they have no home to go to and no one to welcome them. Many of them will be back in prison within a year. So what is prison like? Okay, today in Ireland, we have 4,059 people in custody. On this day last year, we had 3,890. And on the same day in 2017, we had 3,740. So prison numbers are going up. Contrary to media reports today that they're going down, they are in fact going up. In Mountjoy today, we have 696 male prisoners, ranging in age from 18 to 62 years of age, serving sentences from one month to life imprisonment. So I'll give you some statistics or some, some research. 70% of prisoners have mental health issues, ranging from low-level anxiety and depression right up to psychosis. 80% of prisoners have addiction issues. 60% of prisoners left school before the age of 15 and never completed a state exam. And 96% of the prison population come from communities where, at, where opportunities have been lacking. Now, traditionally, we would describe these communities as disadvantaged, socially deprived, and marginalized. But for the people living in those communities, they don't see it like that. They're very proud of where they come from. They help and support one another throughout difficult times. They simply haven't had the opportunities that others from more affluent areas of society have had. So you would have heard some of our speakers talk today about the services available to prisoners. And yes, we have an excellent education service, work and training to provide new skills for prisoners, addiction counsellors working hard with prisoners on their addiction issues, psychology team working closely with prisoners, dedicated prison officers who have a unique relationship with prisoners, and it's, it's recognised throughout the world that the relationship between prison officers and prisoners in Ireland is, uh, stands out on its own. But that's only one side of prison. There is a dark side to prison. Prison can be violent. Prisoners and prison officers face violence regularly. Today in Mountjoy, we have 237 prisoners on protection. They've requested protection for a variety of reasons. Some may owe money for drugs. Some may be fighting in various gangs. And others may be just simply too afraid to come out of their cell. Some of you may have seen the recent documentary, Michael Inside, directed by Frank Berry, written and directed by Frank Berry. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I'd urge you to watch it, because it really is a stark description of prison life. Now, I would take exception with one aspect, and that is the director's portrayal of the governor of the prison as a cold, uncaring individual. <laughs> and of course, we're not like that. But the story goes on to tell, it tells the story of a young man called Michael, who is sentenced to a short period in prison, three months, for possession of a controlled substance. And in that short space of time, Michael experiences you know, untold violence. He's, he's dragged into the prison system, and it's not long before he's now a criminal himself. Prison creates criminals. Prison creates prisoners. So what I would say is, only those people that absolutely need to be in prison should be in prison. Every alternative should be explored, particularly for young people. Because once you bring a young person into prison, he now has a criminal record, he's a prisoner. And it's very, very difficult to, for him to get off that merry-go-round. The families of prisoners also suffer greatly. And in many cases, families are bullied and intimidated into paying off drug debts bringing in contraband into prisons, or whatever pressure can be brought to bear on them by gangs and gang lords and, and, and serious criminals in our community. So what can we do as a society? Well, one significant barrier for prisoners is the opportunity to gain employment and to support themselves and their families. And I've met many employers who would say, absolutely, I'd happily take on a prisoner. And they genuinely mean that. But when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of the situation, it's too challenging. The prisoners have many, many challenges, as we've talked about, and it rarely works out. And there are some exceptions, and there are some notable exceptions, but by and large, we don't have a good track record on employing ex-offenders. 
But there is another way, and I'm going to give you an example, and it's unfortunate that it's for, from a company in the UK. But there's a company in the UK called Timpsons, and they have about 1,300 retail outlets. Um, and the, the, the business they are in is uh, key, key cutting, shoe repair, um, printing, uh, mobile phone, telephone repair, all, all very, very skills that are very attainable for people. And a number of years ago, the CEO, James Tinson, decided he would like to try and do something for prisoners. So he decided they would pilot by taking on 10 ex-offenders. And they, everything seemed great. They brought on the, tech offender, tech, the 10 offenders. And of course, it was a disaster. The prisoners, ex-prisoners stole from them. They sold drugs in the shops. And some of them didn't turn up for work. And it wasn't long before they were all gone. But James Timpson decided, you know, he wasn't done there. He wanted to continue at this and look at it and see why did it work out? Why did it not work out? Why was it so bad? So they decided that they would go into the prison and work with the prison service and train the prisoners before they were released. They also got a good sense of the problems the prisoners faced. So they had an understanding of addiction. They had an understanding of the issue of trying to find suitable accommodation. So they realized that they would have to support prisoners in a more than, more than just giving them a job. They would have to put a wraparound service and help them when they came back into the community. Today, Timpsons employ 535 prisoners. That's 10% of their workforce. James Timpson will say that they're some of his best employees. They are loyal. They're very grateful for being given the opportunity. And many of them, many of them have gone up the ranks of the, of the organization to become shop managers and regional managers. So I would say to people of influence here tonight, you need to take a chance on people. You need to give them a chance. You need to understand that they will fail, and we will have to give them another chance, and maybe another chance. And the big companies and the big, the big employer organizations among us must make it part of their company policy to support prisoners. May, say, do something like Timpsons do. I we will make 10% of our workforce uh, people from prisons or from the, long, the live register or the long-term unemployed. That's the kind of thing we need to do to make a real impact. So I'm going to tell you now a story about uh, a young man that I encountered here some time ago. And his name is Tommy. And Tommy is uh, 25 years of age. He's been in prison. He's been out of prison for only three months since his 18th birthday. I first encountered Tommy about 18 months ago following a really serious assault on a prison officer. And while dealing with the disciplinary report, Tommy was clearly out of his head on drugs and he was in a really, really bad place, serious anger issues, and he spent some time in what we call our challenging behaviour unit. Following that, he went back to the original part of the prison he was in and he carried on with life. And, but I was aware of him at this stage and myself and the chief, when we would walk around the prison, we would occasionally meet Tommy and see how he was getting on. And it, it was clear he was on a slippery slope. He was really going into a dark place. And on one particular day, we had an altercation and he said that nobody was helping him. And he probably was right. Um, so, I referred Tommy to our addiction team, and our addiction team assessed Tommy to see was he in the right place to deal with his addiction issues. And everybody felt it was a good time for Tommy to go and, and take on our drug treatment program. So Tommy did the drug treatment program, he, he graduated from that, and he migrated to this part of the prison, so to the progression unit. And while in the progression unit, he engaged with all the services that were available to him. Yeah, psychology again, addiction. Uh, he went to Philly's Unfucked, is it Philly Unfucked program? And, uh, and everything was going really well. I met Tommy uh, at a family event at Christmas for his, he had his sister and his nephew there. And his sister was unbelievably proud of how well Tommy had done and how far he had come. And she was bubbling with pride and Tommy was showing his nephew the activities they were doing, he was fully involved, and it was a really, really happy story. So Christmas came and went, and uh, I carried on with my work, and Tommy carried on with his sentence. And I got a call from an officer to say that Tommy was looking to speak to me, and I uh, said I would, but between one thing and another, I didn't get to see Tommy. And then I got a letter from him, and in the letter, Tommy outlined how well he had come, how, how far he had come, uh, what he would like to do for the remainder of his sentence, what he would like to do when he left prison, and you know, 
Really, really positive stuff. But the very last le line in the letter was, please don't forget me. And it struck me because I had forgotten Tommy. I, I had assumed that Tommy was in a great place and he was going to move on and that was the end of it and we'd never see Tommy again. But the reality for so many prisoners is that you know, the, the, the challenges they face are so immense that they will trip up and they will need support and continued support in the community. So we as a community can no longer rely on the prison service or the probation service to fix these people. And I don't like to use the word fix. It's a, community, it's a society problem. Society owes these people a second chance. So I'm going to finish and show you an image. Everybody faces challenges and, and needs support and help throughout their life. Last weekend, Tommy helped me finish the park run. <laughs> so thank you very much.